Let's start this video with something that I'm not giving out to the public just yet. Auto lane change. I had it in the past and it used to work pretty good. It used to work a little bit better than this. But as you can see, we've changed to the right lane and now we're changing to the left lane. So yes, this is running 0 0.5.9. Um, this is basically just turning auto lane change on. Everything's in there, everything's ready to go. It obviously, it's got different tuning. So you might be asking, if I've got it working like this repeatedly, left and right, even when there's a, uh, we call it the camber of the road. I think Americans call it the crown. Why wouldn't I give this out to everyone? Well, here's why. Every now and then, it decides to do something like this. And look. Hey guys, long time. So here we are on 0 0.5.9. Now this, this I had ready for release day, but unfortunately I've just been so busy with other jobs I didn't get the time to finish it. And I'm basically gonna do this to cover everything that we've got on this. So if we look at the screen right now, we've got cam, mad, and sound. Sound just enables sound. Uh, if you got a neon gold, you will want to disable that because for whatever reason, it distorts pretty much anything you play. Basically, it gives a little sound when you engage and disengage. Mad lets you drive with the accelerator and the brake, so it steers all the time. It's a much better solution. Um, you just hit the cruise button to turn steering on and off. So for example, it's steering, I'll grab the steering wheel, hit the cruise, oh, hit the cruise, and now we can see that um, I'm driving because the green area is gone. Um, I hit cruise again, and it's driving again. Enable the cruise, it goes up to the speed, to the speed set point. And as you can see, our sets, the speed limit is 100, and it's set it to 103, and it did that automatically. Now that one is in the settings menu, speed offset I've got set to three, and we're choosing to let it run as um, we're giving the car longitudinal control. The last one is cam. That's the one that lets the stock messages of the car through. So what we're talking about here is things like lane departure warning and things like that. Uh, we always send through things like automatic emergency braking and uh, other critical messages that are to do with safety. So what that lets through is things like lane departure warning and if you enable lane keep assist when this isn't in control, uh, as in open pilot isn't in control, lane keep assist would work. So there's no cars to the left of me, so if I wander to the left, uh, there you go, there's the beep 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 to say that um, I wandered out of my lane. So that's the stock system that's generating that beep and using the stock camera. So that's what cam enables. Down the bottom we've got the record and the little blue icon. That's me recording the screen now so that you can see what's going on. Uh, down the bottom left you'll see there's a little picture of a weld. That's bright and white. That's telling me that I'm using, or uh, well, that it's got a GPS lock. It's got a valid OSM map location and hence it's got my GPS speed location. To the left of that is a little picture of a head that's greyed out. That's because I don't have driver monitoring set up and that's because I'm in Australia and we drive on the left hand side of the road. We have a right hand drive car and the, it, they still don't support right hand drive but I've heard that that may be changing very soon which is nice. And that's basically what you see on the screen. Now, I for a long time I've had uh, an alignment issue with this vehicle. Now this is this is just a warning to anyone who's you know getting their alignment done just because they have an expensive bit of equipment and they say that they're the best they've very likely got no idea what they're doing. So you can see at the moment when I'm traveling straight I'm about 1.7 degrees, 2 degrees out. Um, we'll wait till we get on a straight and have a look at it. Uh, but basically it's it's still out a little bit, but it's not too bad. Now, when I got this brand new from the factory, it was zero, and I'm not joking you, it was zero, it was, it was spot on. Um, and then once you took camber and speed and things like that, it, it'd be as much as, you know, 0.5 degrees as you're traveling down the road. It was really good. Which means that anything other than that is an imperfect alignment, um, which is true regardless what people may say. 
And you see at the moment I'm, well, we're veering left again, trying to get straight on a freeway as nearly impossible. But we're about negative 1.7 either way that we're straight. So I asked for this alignment to be done. It was negative 3.7 or to technically I think it was worse than that for me when I was traveling straight. Don't know what it was doing then. The car obviously glitched it. The sun's not in the perfect position. I actually drove all the way um, from Horsham to Melbourne, which was three and a half hours without touching the steering wheel. I was actually quite impressed. So it was about negative 3.7. I brought it in and went to the service and I said, I want my wheel up and done. And they brought it back and they uh, and I took it for his first drive. I'm like, yep, it'll all be good. 2.7 degrees out. They improved it by one degree. And it was still garbage. So I took it back to them and said, you know, it's no good. So what they've done is done the wheel alignment again. Now they've got it to 1.7. They're claiming that, you know, the wheel alignment went out because they can't, you know, guarantee that it'll stay in alignment from the moment that it leaves. So they, they claim that, you know, it must have gone out between them doing it and me driving it uh, two kilometres later. I got just a load of shit. Really unimpressed. Um, but... Yeah, okay, so we're driving straight now, and you can see that we're 2, 1.7, 1.6, 2. Uh, I, I've taken um, Teslas down this exact same road, and for some reason, none of them like those toll, tollways. They, the Teslas do the exact same thing. So whatever it is that you're doing, comma, with tuning your AI, you've got the same glitch as a Tesla do. Anyway, yeah, so we're... Look at the numbers. I'd, I'd say we're, you know, you'd say maybe we're 2.3. It's really hard. It's really hard to say, but we're somewhere around that two. 1.72. So this was their second attempt, and because of all their insidious claims, basically they're 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 charging me a second time for a second wheel alignment, which is still isn't that good. Like I'm happy. It's it's good enough now it's not taking a constant torque uh, we're coming into slow traffic um, the oscillations at low speeds are generally not present what you actually notice is that it's the lines here because of the shadows uh, the lane where it's detecting my lane is actually jumping all over the place if the truck wasn't in front of me we wouldn't be seeing this particular issue so that's got nothing to do with training that's got nothing to do with anything other than just basically shadows and traveling slow so yeah I'm getting charged for two wheel alignments both of them done wrong and I can guarantee you that I'll never be going back to them again oh, quite pathetic really pathetic and you know who you are and there's a good chance you're watching this video and I think you've done a really really pathetic job and I think your attitude towards it is even worse the fact that you've come up with a hundred different excuses and still not fix the problem so that's it's just bad all right steering override so this is something that I really disliked on the comma system is the way the steering override ride felt basically what it was was you started a fight and then it just kind of click and have no fight that's the best way I can describe it you fight you fight click nothing and you're just driving an ordinary car and then as you get back into the area, it's kind of like click and it's back in. I really hated that feeling. It feels, it feels like it dies. Um, and when you're trying to feel when it regains, it's, it feels dead again. I've really got problems with these shadows at the moment. But that's alright, we'll be out of the city soon. And then we get onto real roads. So yeah, uh, what I've basically got now, as you apply torque and as you apply torque, it reduces the amount of torque that it applies and the more that I increase it the less that it applies which means that you basically get to a point of inflection where the two of them uh, equalize and effectively what it acts like is you just got to turn a little bit harder so at the moment like let's say I had nothing on there for the record I'm not using cruise control uh, I'm driving with the accelerator and brake I've got a trailer on board as I always do um, this time it's loaded fairly heavily uh, not, not not a legal limit or anything like that. I mean, it's probably just one and a half ton behind me. But 
um, I'm, I'm driving with the accelerator and brake because I'm in shitty traffic and I've got a, a load behind me which makes it unsafe to trust the, I'll let the cruise control go and I'll show you why but basically it just doesn't leave, it doesn't brake early enough when you got a heavy load on behind. It's, yeah, it's doing okay this time, but it, it just, it leaves braking too late, and then by the time that it starts to brake heavily, it's, it, it, it doesn't brake safely for a trailer. It's making a live me at the moment, it did okay, it still should have been braking heavier earlier, but it's making a live me at the moment. Yeah, it is making a live of me. So back onto what I was actually talking about, which was the steering. Basically, the, what this results in, with this type of uh, feel, is that you know if I had to fight it normally, I'd have to fight two newton meters of it fighting. Right now, I've got to fight bugger all. When I say bugger all, I mean it's about half a newton meter of it fighting. It's well, actually it might be one. But either way, it's not very much, and it ends up just being a different feel on the steering wheel. Turn on the blinker. This is another thing not in the common version. Turn on the blinker and it disables steering. Blinker goes off, there it goes, it takes over. I'll, usually I hold the steering wheel until I feel it take over. That's something again, if you get the commas override, because you might still have a bit of torque in the steering wheel, you wouldn't feel it take over. You need that little bit of a reassurance to say, yes, it's okay, I'm in control. You can take your hand off the wheel now. Is if you don't have that little bit of control, either you take your hand off while it's still driving or you leave your hand on there the whole time and there's no reason you can't have your hand on there the whole time it'll drive just fine but you know very well that's not how anyone drives with these vehicles so I need to make sure that it's safe for people driving it the way they actually do drive it yeah that's that's the steer override and why it's done the way it is the blinkers uh, I've never had a single person say they want to fight it to change lanes I have seen it mentioned in other makes, whether that's just because people are stubborn and they've gotten used to a certain thing and they're just stubborn to change or try something else, or whether it's because other people haven't implemented it as nicely as what I have, I don't know, because I don't drive a different make. This is, this is my car and this is the what I built. I have, I, I have theories on how they've done it. No, it might be that, you know, because I, I keep the steering torque away one second after the blinker goes off. I don't, you know, the moment that the stalk goes click back into the middle, I don't immediately apply torque again. Additionally, I look at the flashing, not just the stalk position. So if I just do a momentary, I'll do it, just a momentary, I've got no torque while it's flashing, and when it stops, now it takes over. So I've got that delay at the end, um, as well as I can use it with momentary, and being with momentary means that I basically I'm driving the vehicle naturally. Now with auto lane change, obviously this is all uh, redundant if you turn that on because it's gonna change the lane for you anyway. Um, I've taken auto lane change out, I've discussed why. I am gonna bring it back in, but I'm going to be Suggesting that people tune it themselves and don't just use it. Okay, this is why you can't let the cruise control drive with a trailer because it would have started braking heavy enough by the time I was inside that old territory's anus. I, I would have been embedded inside that vehicle. And that's, that's bad. It, it's not a good idea and that's unfortunately just... If I've got electric brakes on an electric brake trailer, it actually works fine because it, it doesn't need to apply that extra braking force. But this particular trailer, it's got mechanical brakes on it. Uh, it's got a brake override. Basically what it is is uh, the coupling slides inside a, it's a, a cylinder, slides inside another cylinder with a spring in it. And the vehicle needs to apply additional force in order to push that spring back before it pulls on a cable, which then applies the brakes on the trailer. So you have a lot of additional braking force needed on the vehicle before the trailer brakes start to do anything and even then they're only going to apply after that additional force that you've already applied which means that it, they never really do much they just do a little bit to help I'm gonna to have to steer on this bridge because of these shadows so 
with, with a trailer like this, the stock system, it just doesn't apply the brakes hard enough early enough. As a result, you end up with a vehicle that wants to ram other vehicles. But like I said, if I got my bigger trailer on behind, which has got electric brakes, it's beautiful because the brake control that I've got is, eh, it's the best of the best, but it's kind of shit because they're all shit. It's a Red Arc, um, Toe Pro, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's a Pro because I thought it sounded good on the name and it's a Toe because you, it's for when you're towing things and yeah, anyway, what a dumb name. So it, it they claim that it uses an accelerometer for how much it breaks. Uh, I believe that there's one there, but I believe it's also tuned horrendously. And it also seems to have a timer on it. Now this is ridiculous, but it's also what the cheaper ones have. The cheaper systems um, either have a pendulum or a timer. And the way they work is that you put your foot on the brake and then as the time goes on, they progressively increase the amount of brake force on the trailer. Not really the way it should be done, but what you end up with with those is you put your foot on the brake, you're slowing down, and then all of a sudden the trailer starts pulling the vehicle up. Uh, yeah. Um, let's just say you've set the brakes too hard, you put your foot on the brake and it's not braking enough, not braking enough, not braking perfectly, braking, well it's locked up now. Ugh. So they're garbage. So this Red Arc has the um, accelerometer so that it brakes relative to how much the vehicle's braking. It works to a degree, but like I said, I believe it's also got a timer in there that starts applying it heavier the longer that you're braking, which means that it's not perfect either. Honestly, I think what they need is a um, load cell in the coupling so that you can actually see what the force of the vehicle is and then apply the brakes relative to the force being pushed into the vehicle. Much like what the overrun couplings on a mechanical or hydraulic brake trailer is, but just an electric system that monitors it and you'd have something superior then. But they don't make that, do they? I might make one myself. Might do that. So yeah, with the electric brakes, you end up with the issue of uh, it applies the brakes and as it's releasing the brakes and releasing the brakes, the trailer brakes have clamped on so tight that it's still slowing the vehicle and then all of a sudden the vehicle releases the brakes and it starts, whoa, it's now all of a sudden we're traveling faster and click back on the brakes again and the trailer starts applying the brakes heavier and heavier. So the, the electric brake isn't perfect either because the brake controller isn't perfect. How much can I ramble on about a brake controller? Well, if they made these things properly, I wouldn't have to ramble on about them. But they don't make them properly. And they charge a lot for them. I mean, what is this? It, it's, a, it's, it's supposedly an accelerometer. Like I said, I, I don't know that I trust that. Um, it's a timer. It's got a FET that outputs power to a uh, electromagnet. It's got a little dial on the front which adjusts how much goes out to the electromagnet. I know it's PWM control because you can hear the thing buzzing. You turn up the talk, you can hear it buzz at a different tone. It's 100% it's it's a PWM, so... It, they charge a few hundred dollars for what's probably, you know, 20 bucks worth of stuff. Uh, and then they don't do it properly. Um, yeah. I'm sure no one watching this cares about any of that stuff. So I'm going to leave it that it doesn't matter how much you spend on your brake control, you're buying rubbish. We'll leave it at that. So my car, actually, I, well, we might as well keep going on about the car and the imperfections. I've got a new radiator in this car. So when it went in for its 30,000 service, which was done at about 31, um, there was a little bit of radiator fluid leaking. I, I, this doesn't surprise me because some around 28,000 k's or so on the odometer, I thought that I smelled radiator fluid a couple times. But there was no sign of it, I couldn't see anything. So you just, you know, you can't see it. The levels all look fine, you kind of ignore it. And it goes away, the next time you add, you, can't, you don't smell it. So anyway, there was a little bit there and they, they said, yep, we'll just watch it. Uh, you know, we'll look at it the next service in 15,000. That's how minor they thought it was. Anyway, uh, I brought it back in because of this alignment issue. Um, so I brought it back to them. I, well, like I said, never going to use them for alignment again. They're garbage. We'll make sure that recording is working. It is. Um, yeah, brought it back in for alignment, and they, when they put it up on the hoist, there was radiator fluid everywhere. It painted the whole bottom of the car. 
that was pretty bad. So then I was like, yep, time for a new radiator. So that's the reason I haven't been driving the car for a bit, was that it took over a week for the radiator to, co- radiator to come in. Um, and then I've had other things on. Like, I've had probably the two busiest weeks since I started my couple companies. And I've had other people doing the driving around um, because I've just been too busy to get away from the computer. I've been stuck there. I've been, without a joke, I've been going to bed at 3 a.m., and waking up at 8 a.m. to go and, or no, I shouldn't say that, 7 a.m. to go and repeat the whole thing the next day. And I've been doing that for the last couple of weeks. And I don't have the time to be doing this trip today. I'm just sick of sitting in front of my desk and thought I'd like to sit down in front of the steering wheel instead. So, yeah, I've just been busy. I've been really busy. And that's the only reason that I'm late getting 0.59 out to everyone. It's just been, yeah, it's just been crazy, crazy busy for me. And I can't really complain because that pays the bills. I suppose there's some more exciting stuff. Is uh, I've got everything now for replaying people's drives at home. So while my car's out driving, I've got a whole new E on. I've got a couple pandas. I've got a dev board. I've got everything. I only need to swap this E on for the other E on because once I get out of the city, I start getting dodgy reception and it fails and it's it's really gone downhill something's gone wrong with the phone uh, like with the 3G part of it so I've got to swap it over to the other Eon that's the whole purpose of the other one but um, yeah I've got everything so that I can develop on the bench so there'll be no more of this uh, you know 20 attempts to try and get something sorted out for somebody remotely you go for a drive jump onto my.com.ai send me send me the couple exports of the video and um, the log segment of a part of a drive and then I'll replay it and I'll go and sort out all the problems. Uh, if you've got an issue with say it's not steering or you're getting a dash error or something like that that's not open pilot and specific to your vehicle we might still need to do diagnostics on your vehicle but for the most part what you send me should be sufficient for me to sort out any particular issues that anyone is having. Now I want to extend this to if your car you think is working really well but there's something that is a bit unusual. So let's just say that we're driving along here and you say oh I, I always used to have my car work perfectly but now it every time I go around this corner it wants to ram me into these cement barriers. Send me those two files and send me a link to a cabana where the segment is and I'll look at it, I'll replay it, I'll see exactly what goes on and I should be able to fix it in one. Of course, um, I started this video where there was no lines. This is interesting. Uh, You'll see that occasionally it can actually uh, nab just enough lines from these reflectors to drive this area. I didn't actually expect this to come in. Obviously, there's so little in the way here. There's not much for it to grab. But... It's doing a okay job, I suppose. As, yeah, I really wasn't expecting to show this. It just timed really well that as I clicked record, we got no lines. And we're in roadworks and everything else that, oh, no driver input. That shows how well this has been going in this nothing area. Oh, those reflectors are running out. Those reflectors are running out. Oh, are they? I can't even tell. Oh, no, they're still there still there there's a chance have have faith so things like this is where open pilot in the recent models has actually come quite a long way because we're not we're, there's no lines there's no dashes there's just little tiny I hope this shows up on that 4k camera this there's really bugger all here for it to go off and it's it's not at all what you'd say driving straight but it's not particularly driving bad no I'm actually glad I hit record just here because I bet you wouldn't drive this well in the daylight for the record in the daylight it would probably be a lot worse because the lights are reflecting off the reflectors which makes them very obvious dots in the daylight that probably wouldn't be as obvious because most of these reflectors are covered in tar since it's a new road so in the daylight, I doubt it would have actually driven down this section by itself. So oh, I reckon it's quite impressive. I do indeed. 
I will be including this in the video, as you will see right now, because you're watching it. Yeah, it's very impressive. And we're over it. That lines again. I wish we can get back up to the speed limit. Oh, I'm glad I posted that. Now, I was actually more so recording this. This is the same trip, the same trip that I actually got lost on. But I didn't record me getting lost, so no one will ever know. Uh, just to explain this whole getting lost that you don't know about, I was happily driving along and I was not far away from an exit that I have to take. <clears throat> now, I, my phone rang maybe 10 minutes before this exit and this phone call took a fair bit of, uh, let's just say I had to put a lot of thought into it. I was thinking, I was thinking deep on this phone call. So all I was doing is watching the road and making sure that it doesn't drive into another car and concentrating on what this person was saying and how I responded. Yes, it was one of those phone calls where I had to be careful about how I responded as well. So not just listening to what they're saying, but being careful about how I responded. Uh, it was crappy. It went on for an hour. This phone call was an hour long. So one hour crappy phone call, concentrating really hard. So at the end of the phone call, I kind of pay attention to where I am. I'm not, I'm basically, I look around, I'm like, oh, where, where am I? And I look and there's a sign going past and I've never heard of the place before. I'm like, oh, oh crap. Uh, so yeah, I, I zoom out on the GPS because the GPS is still telling me to go straight ahead. I'm like, this is really weird. I'll zoom out. I'm, I'm an hour down the road somewhere else entirely. I'm taking this great big got to take this great big triangle to get back to where I was which ended up being on a single lane road and I really really stuffed up I basically I missed my exit and I just kept driving and just driving at about a uh, 45 degree angle away from where I should have been going and yeah so I should have been getting home about 20 minutes ago but I didn't so that gives me, give me the opportunity to make this bit of the video where I'm driving at dusk and into night. Now, it was surprisingly people still ask this question even though I've posted this in videos many times before. So I have many others done videos on this. It's mentioned all the time and in fact so much so that in its early days when I was first, well not early days, it's actually late days, but anyway, when I first come to the scene it was basically said that open pilot was more like night pilot in the sense that you drove so good at night and it was garbage in the day. Yes, open pilot drives great in the night. It always used to drive better in the night. It still drives great in the night. Does it drive better in the night than daylight? Well, going by that little patch just back there, my answer would be yes. It still does better at night than it does in the day. The reason is simple. It looks for lines. In the day when the sun's shining, the glare's reflecting off the road, it's not that obvious where the lines can be. And at times, even as a human, you can't define the line against the glare and reflection on the road. So, Please check the speed when we're at night, all of that seems to disappear. There's, the big reflection becomes a minor reflection. What are you doing, car? The big reflection becomes, I've got to push my foot on the brake, but that doesn't mean I touch a steering wheel. Just remember that anyone that's not driving a Hyundai, you could have this. You just need to convince your fork maintainers that this is a feature that you should have. I just think it's mental that anything but this is standard, but that's not what I'm talking about. If you look at this road right now, the white lines are great. They're they're extremely clear and you can see that there's a shiny bit on the road that shiny bit on the road in the daytime when the sun's just a little bit in front of you is bright white brighter than the line and poor open pilot can't tell what where, where's the line what's the reflection is the reflection of the line is the line that I can't see the line I, it doesn't know it, it flickers, it flickers, oh, you can see me, oh, there's a steering wheel here, it flickers like this, it goes, oh there's a line, oh there's a line, there's a line, there's a line, it doesn't know where the line is, 
which means your steering wheel is doing this. It's going uh, 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 to everywhere that it thinks the line can be. It's not happy. A lot of time that doesn't happen because there's no glare. Cars coming towards you, you see how there's a little bit of glare on the road. I haven't had it happen in the last few versions. That used to occasionally want to drive towards the car because they go, oh, the white light's not there, it's over there, it's over there in the middle of that other car, I'm going to go drive you into it. It doesn't do that anymore. It hasn't done that in a long time, it hasn't driven into other cars. Gaps in the side, it still causes a few issues now and then like you saw there, but for the most part it's pretty good. I believe this is 50 k's up here, no, it's all 60, cool. So, yes, no time driving, still stunning. Actually, just open pilot in general is stunning. And if, you, if you've got yourself a Hyundai right or a Kia or a Genesis for that fact, with lane keep assist, you are doing yourself a major disservice not buying this kit. Now, just a little bit about the community that's building both the Open Pilot and the Fork. So, comma.ai is the company that's behind Open Pilot. And their prime baby is their computer vision side of it. It's the, it, it's the model that they've developed is their baby. That's that's the key. That, that's the keys to it. That they think they have the ultimate line recognition, and that's all it is at the moment. It's just line recognition. But having said that, that's not an easy task to achieve. But they believe they have the best line recognition. So much so that if everything else is copied by somebody else, it's not going to matter without their amazing line recognition. And the truth is that they're correct at least for now, and if they're lucky, they're going to remain correct. So, what we have is the open source software, which is Open Pilot, which is about half of the, half of the solution. It's, it basically takes, you know, the vision, and does all the maths on it, and that's it. Then you have the vehicle models, that sit, uh, basically it's, it's still open pilot, but it sits after that. And then it goes and interprets the car and pushes that into open pilot and takes what open pilot says and it pushes it out to the car. And it just basically, that's, that's what it's doing. And this particular part that is the car is the part that most fork maintainers play with. But we play with a lot of other stuff. Open Pilot's open source, so we can play with whatever we want. We got the UI. That's obviously, you know, stuff that we play with outside of it. And obviously I've been playing with uh, the vehicle model. I've been playing with the MPC. <coughs> I've been doing other things like that. So we play outside of that area as well. And all of our forks are a little bit unique. But for, for the most part, a lot of our forks are just how we make a car work. And that's a lot of it. So things like, you know, when you disengage, how you disengage, how the steering wheel turns based upon error that it's seeing, uh, all of those things, they're managed by the fork maintainers and they're not necessarily a small thing to do. I mean, you look at it and you go, gee, there's not much line of code. You've only got, you know, there's under a thousand lines of code that you've done. There might even be a couple hundred lines of codes that you've, code that you've done. The problem is that it's not the lines of code, it's the amount of times you have to try something over and over and over and over until you get that one line of code to work right. And that that is very hard for people to appreciate. For example, just trying to make this car steer in the center of the lane and drive around the corner without the steering wheel jerking at all. I've, I'm the guy that is building this fork, right? Okay, I. Th this is the first ever Kia, the first Hyundai, the first whatever. This was the first car. And I got it steering at 5,000 Ks, which I've said a million times. And we've got 34,000 Ks on the clock. 
and I'm still making minor tweaks trying to make it work that little bit better. I have spent a huge amount of time in little things like that. Every time a new person come in with a car, I would spend hours and hours and hours helping them. They'd, they'd have your shoes, I'd help them, they'd send me cabanas and I'd go and look through that, send a new version to them, to try that, jump on TeamViewer, they'd go out for a drive, I'd jump on their machine, I go and make tweaks while they're driving, pull over, try again, try again, try again. Constantly making little tweaks, a lot of effort, and then a new car comes along and I've got to go through it all again. You put in a fix to this new car and all of a sudden, oh no, I've broken a couple old ones. Why? And then you go back and you help those people. It's taken a lot of time to get to the point now where I believe that if you buy any Hyundai, Kia or Genesis, 2019 build or earlier, it will just plug in and work. Now that, that alone is still needs a lot of work. It does work and we've proven it. We've got two, actually no, we've got four cars now, as of now, that do not have fingerprints. I mean, there's no fingerprint. It doesn't know what car it is. You plug it in and it goes, unknown car on Amatex Fork. That's what it says in the logs. And uh, I'd love to see the temperature to know um, how many people are actually using this fork because the truth is I, I don't know. Um, I know there's a lot more than post publicly because occasionally I get a copy of a DM that's been sent to somebody else. But either way, I've put a huge amount of time into this and for the past three or four months, most of my time has gone into helping other people. Okay, so the main reason that this part of the video was that it was just getting too long. Basically, I don't want my videos to go much over 40 minutes. I reckon that's about the maximum I should be doing. But please leave in the comments if you think they should be shorter or longer. Now, for this last little bit of the video, I want to put a special thanks out there to Kita, uh, sorry, TK211X. He basically is the first point of contact for everyone in the community. When somebody joins in, he's going to be most likely the first person that jumps in and helps you out. If you're having trouble, he's probably going to be the one-on-one -on -one with you to sort it out. Uh, I appreciate this a lot because I'd prefer to spend my time improving the port, making things better for everyone and only supporting individuals when I really have to. And he allows me to do that. I can't put a lot of time aside to open pilot. It's not a job. It's not something I get paid for. It's just a hobby. So I can't treat it as anything but a hobby, which means that the people like him, uh, they basically they basically give me more time to improve this for everyone. So massive thanks to him. Now that's the other one is that none of us get paid for this. So when you purchase using the affiliate link below, now we get a little something. You purchase the parts for the draft from tk 21 x we get a little something. This is the only little something we get. So help us. Don't don't go and you know look for the back door, get it as cheap as you can somewhere else. Just remember the hundreds or thousands of hours we put into making this for everyone and yeah, support us where it's due. Now the last one is um, one of the next changes I'm going to make and this is becoming a bit of a priority. This is something I think is gross negligence by car manufacturers. That is when, okay, let's just do it this way. What is the number one cause of deaths on the roads in Australia? Drowsy driving, falling asleep at the wheel. That's it. Car manufacturers for years have had lane keep assist. It's a requirement that it's in all cars as of 2018 in Australia and 2019 is becoming standard in America. So the technology is there to keep you in the lane. What does a manufacturer do? 15 seconds of not touching the steering wheel, stop steering, but leave the cruise control engaged. End result, 100 k's now into a tree and you're dead. Yep. That's the manufacturer's solution to the number one cause of deaths on the road. Lane keep assist does nothing. And let's just say that you're in a city. It's it's going to drive you into cement barrier. It's going to drive you into somebody's house. It's going to drive you into oncoming traffic. Regardless how you look at it, the end result is horrible. It's gross negligence. It honestly is. So at this stage, I keep steering indefinitely, but I also don't touch cruise control. That's also not a good solution. 
So what we're going to be doing is when we no longer see input from the driver, when we request it and there's no input, it's going to reduce the cruise control down to a lower speed and then disable. It's going to keep you in the lane and it's going to keep you in the lane specifically to stop any of those dangers from occurring. So that means that you know, you're going to have cars honking around you. This requires, and this is unfortunate, but this also requires breaking a lot of common standards. Their theory as well is at the moment that you cancel cruise control, touching the foot brake or cancel cruise control, you stop steering. This is gross negligence. Honestly, it is. Because, again, you're, you have the opportunity to make the vehicle safe and you've decided to go against that opportunity to make it safe and make it do something else. So I'm going to be doing it the best... So assume that somebody falls off asleep at the wheel, this is going to keep you in your lane and slow you down to make any possible incident as minimal as it can be. Let me know what you think. Do you actually disagree with my thoughts on this one? And if so, why? Because I, for the life of me, I cannot understand why everyone that builds these systems wants to kill people. Because as far as I can see, that's what they're doing. Anyway, thanks for watching. Please subscribe, um, share these videos. If you go to Hyundai or Kia, it's time for you to join us because it's it will be one of the best things you've done.